Every time I crack a can of cloverleaf oysters, afterwards I feel like the lovely aluminum can could be repurposed for something. Before this, I have just given up and surrendered them to the recycle bin. But this time, a perfect storm happened to save a can. I ordered these 16-bit stereo codec chips from AliExpress, just as a curiosity really, and have been wanting to try one out. Another factor is my mother's birthday's coming up, and I like to make her something unique whenever possible. The third factor is that I love new and challenging things to design for the 3D printer. So a few days ago I decided to go ahead with this. The idea is that this will be an audio Magic 8-Ball. For those of you too young to know what the Magic 8-Ball is, I'll quickly explain. So you ask a yes-no type of question. Shake the Magic 8-Ball. And after some swirling around, the answer appears in the tiny window. This was invented in 1946, but is still being sold today. Talk about a success story. Anyway, back to the project at hand. While the rectangular oyster can seems like a simple shape, there's little reinforcement indentations along the side, so I had to be careful to make the inside frame slightly smaller than the deepest part of the indentation. Plus it's slightly flared out toward the top. This isn't a problem though, because shoe glue will fill the gaps. It had to be made in two pieces or else it wouldn't be able to be inserted, right? The original idea was to use a 9 volt battery, but in interest of having the speaker grill flush, I decided to go with a 12 volt camera battery. This later proved to be an error. The frames are mainly to have something to screw the lid down to, but also as support for the two push buttons and place of the boards. One, an Arduino Pro Mini, and the other, which will have the memory chip, and a PTA11 16-bit stereo DAC, or codec, plus an amp for the speaker. The little board supports can be removed to get the frame into the can. After gluing, I had to lightly screw down the top to make sure they stayed aligned. It all fit nicely in place. I let the glue dry. Next is the PC board. As I'm in a hurry, I went to the classic draw-by-hand method, plus to keep in practice. I'm still using an old version of Flash, a vector-based animation software, as I know it very well, and can do whatever I want with it, in any scale. Makes life interesting. Sometimes I don't even do this, but because I knew that this would be a video, I thought it would be better than a scrap of paper. So now to draw. I use a super fine tip Sharpie pen for this sort of thing. If the board is large and complex, photo etching is the way to go. But something simple like this isn't worth getting out the UV light and the chemicals and everything. Sorry about the view, but as you can see, it's progressing. Those pads are for level shifting, as the 25Q64 megabit flash chip can only tolerate 3.3 volts. And I'm out of 3.3 volt Pro Minis. There it is, ready to etch. Came out pretty good, I guess. So after some parts placement, here's all the components on. The amp is a LM386, which has one watt of power. More than what's needed here, but is easy on batteries. Getting there. So here's the issues I had with the PT8211 DAC, or codec if you prefer. A standard way to connect SBI peripherals is a common clock, MOSI and MISO, then a different chip select for each chip. Problem is the 8211 has no chip select, just a WS, which is probably word select. Plus it's not really SPI, but sort of follows mode zero with the clock and data offset. The solution for this project is to deselect the left channel when we're talking to the flash chip. The left channel is the only one being used. In the data sheet, it states that only the first 16-bit data from MSB is valid. If the input data length is more than 16 bits, other data bits will be truncated, which also means ignored. 
It's unclear when exactly the data is latched, but I would guess on the falling edge again, as the left to right phase is only 0.2 microseconds. So in the sketch, running from a 16 kilohertz interrupt, the WS pin is raised, 16 bits shifted in, then lowered, so the rest of the data can come in, which is the dummy channel. The WS is held low until the next sample, so this sample is not brought to the DAC until then. One thing I've noticed is the amount of noise there is in the audio, which is likely, at least partially, being caused by lack of grounding and filtering. I never put in the 10 ohm resistor and, and the caps. I guess I still could. Other than that, it's quite clear. One thing that might be an issue on a more dedicated setup would be this. So what is the signal to noise when the clock is running? Does there need to be a sample and hold? Not that I'm being critical, but with no isolated analog ground or differential output, I don't think this chip is seriously meant to be hooked up to a decent PA system. Perhaps just a portable toy like this? Of course, I could be wrong. That's another project. Besides, I got 10 for a couple of bucks, so... Anyway, time to load in some samples. This will be done via the serial port and a freeware serial file sender called TerraTerm. I had it in my head to send raw wave files as text representing the binary, so went for a browser-based hex editor to convert the waves and save them as Intel-style text files after editing off the header. So drag and drop the wave file in. So I didn't have to deal with the complexities of wave files. The hex can be selected after data and the four size bytes. As this is 16-bit mono, it's only required that the start is the lower byte, which is always aligns to even bytes in this case. As the flash memory chip is huge, well, 250 seconds at 16 kilohertz sample rate, these zeros don't need to be chopped off, but could be. Now right-click to save as. This means larger than 16-bit address will have a header, which appears not to be supported. Well, whatever. Those will be ignored when read. Checking in the hex file, we can see the Intel hex format. Our little decoder will only save a line if it starts with a colon, has a size of hex 10 or 16 bytes, and is of type 0. The address is ignored as it's an offset from the WAV file. So is the checksum here. But the type must be zero, so any other oddities will be skipped and not written to the flash chip. The hex text will be converted back into binary in the Pro Mini, of course. This worked well, but in hindsight it probably would have been easier just to send the mono files rendered in Reaper as straight binary and skip the predictable header chunk. Guess I have been working with MIDI sysx too much these days, which is all 7-bit data, thus requiring hex. <laughs> It didn't really occur to me until afterwards. So once all the hex files were done, 70 some I believe, time to slowly serial them in with TerraTerm. It went pretty smoothly, but I had to add a modification or two to the sketch. One addition is non yes and no answer of maybe. Because I want a decision of yes, no, maybe to be recurring if the button is clicked again while still powered up with only a 10% chance uh, probability of change, it is important to define them as yes, no, or maybe. Disconnecting and reconnecting every time ensured everything would be perfect for each sample.
This is sped up four times, of course. Finally, the moment of truth. And one last issue I had before finishing. Oops, that button is for random numbers. Concentrate and ask again. Yes! Yes! Well, it sounds pretty nice. As I mentioned before, I moved away from using a 9-volt battery to make room for the speaker to be internal. But we were playing with it for a few minutes, and the 12-volt battery died. Luckily, I hadn't glued in the carrier. So the 9-volt will go back in, and the speaker will have to be moved outside again. After a couple of prints, I decided to go with the retro oval shape. So now to put it together and try it out. The button has to be held for a bit as the Arduino is slow to start. Lady Ada's boot modification made it a lot faster, but still there's some delay from no, no, power-up. No, no, no. My sources say no. No! No, 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 Not that, please! No, 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 no! No, God! No, God, please, no! No! No, sorry. Absolutely not. That would be impossible. My reply is no. I don't think so. Absolutely not. That would be impossible. No. Oh, God, what are we going to do, Carl? Why not? Why not, right? It can be louder, but there's one sample that distorts badly, then kills the power with even the 9-volt battery. So might level that one down a bit. All the others are great, though. Here's some random numbers. There's also a randomization of the sample yes, rate, plus seven. minus 3%. I don't know if you yeah. noticed. Yes, definitely. As I see it, yes. Why not? I have absolute, I have absolute power. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The RGB LED shows green when leaned towards power. yes, red if no, and yellow if maybe, with blue flashing yes, with the audio. Definitely. There's also yeah. stop repeats for one level, Find so the same yes. message doesn't play twice in a row. Yeah. That's the sample that overloads. No, 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 no,
Here's a 3D printed nameplate added. I told the printer it had a 0.2 millimeter tip when it in fact had a 0.4. Seemed to work though, not bad. Concentrate and ask again. I have absolute power. Without a doubt. Seven. Six. Seven. Three. enjoyed this little project. I posted it mostly because of the lack of info on the PT-8211 on YouTube and online generally. Okay, thanks for watching.